Hi, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. By now you all know me, but if not, my name is Mario. I put out videos primarily on clinical research, and I'm super excited for today's video because I want to start covering ICH, E6, R2, good clinical practice. This is the very core of clinical research, so no matter what your role is within clinical research, be it principal investigator, sub-investigator, research nurse, study coordinator, clinical trials associate, study manager, or like me, the clinical research associate, you should be intimately familiar with this document. This is going to be a multi-series uh, of videos covering this. Uh, ICH-E6 R2 is pretty extensive, so I don't want to make one long drawn out video. Uh, so this is gonna be part one. And before I get started, I just wanna quickly mention that there is a draft guidance of this uh, document. So ICH E6 R3 has been released as a draft by the FDA and they are seeking comment. So if you are so inclined, you can look up that document. Uh, I don't expect to be uh, having a finalized version or the FDA to put out a finalized version until sometime in 2025. So that is out there and uh, that may be of interest to you. Just know that usually those documents tend to have additions and not so much subtractions. So they'll cover some of the things that are, don't necessarily have very clear guidance um, in R2. All right, so the other thing I need to remind you, as always, is to take a moment and smash that like button and subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Channel is approaching 2,000 subs, so thank you very much for your support. All right, so without further ado, let us jump into ICH E6 R2 and to the introduction section. I think the only really uh, important thing in the introduction is the definition of good clinical practice. So I will read that out. And it says here that good clinical practice is an international ethical and scientific quality standard for designing, conducting, recording, and reporting trials that involve the participation of human subjects. Compliance with this standard provides public assurance that rights, safety, and well-being of trial subjects are protected, consistent with the principles that have their origins in the Declaration of Helsinki and the that the clinical trial data are credible. So there's um, a long history of problematic clinical trials that have taken place, one of the most famous being um, the Tuskegee experiments. Uh, so the if you look up the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, I won't cover too much um, about the history there, but I will say there are a couple of things that were done wrong um, in that experiment from the perspective of ethical clinical research. Uh, one, there was no informed consent of subjects. Uh, the participants were not made aware of the dangers of participation. Um, they had to agree to an autopsy uh, in order to have funeral costs covered. So this could, again, be an unethical. You're basically um, incentivizing uh, participation by offering to cover funeral costs for autopsies. Um, they were denied treatment. Um, some of the patients, uh, they were de denied known effective treatments and the uh, disease ended up killing them because they weren't treated properly. Uh, they weren't, uh, they were not given the cure even when it was widely and easily available. And there were many misleading ads about the participation um, of that. So those are some of the unethical parts. So the only reason I mentioned that is it's one historical experiment that's pretty um, well known, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment, and it's worth looking um, at that. So this is why we need the guidance. And this is what uh, trials such as that is what has led to uh, very clear guidance of what we consider uh, to be best practices for ethical clinical research. All right. Uh, the only other thing I'll mention is that this was uh, designed taking into uh, account the clinical trial guidance in the EU or European Union, in Japan and the United States. Uh, it also uh, has looked at uh, some of those in Australia, Canada, the Nordic countries, and also the World Health Organization has contributed to the development of ICH E6 R2. The next section after the introduction is the glossary of terms, and I won't read through all the terms, but this is all vital information. This is something to read on your own. It starts with adverse drug reactions, adverse events, and goes on and on uh, with the definition. And I think the definitions are pretty clear. So 
Um, I don't think I can add anything beyond what is in the document in terms of the definitions. You just have to be familiar with them. So jumping into section two, we'll talk about the principles of ICH GCP. So clinical trials should be conducted in accordance with the ethical principles that have their origin in the Declaration of Helsinki and are consistent with GCP and the applicable regulatory requirements. Um, I won't go into the Declaration of Helsinki here. Um, I think that is something that most people in clinical research are familiar with. However, if you do want me to create a video um, on the Declaration of Helsinki, just mention it in the comments and I will gladly create one um, that goes into depth. That is just not within the scope uh, the specifics aren't really within the scope of the CCRA exam, and I don't think it's something you're going to really be tested on um, directly in that exam. So uh, the uh, principles here, it says, before a trial is initiated, foreseeable risks and inconveniences should be weighed against the anticipated benefit of the individual trial subject in society. So this is where the term risk-benefit ratio comes in. You make sure that the, you're weighing them. Uh, the rights, safety, and well-being of trial subjects are the most important considerations and should prevail over all other interests. The available non-clinical and clinical information on an investigational product should be adequate to support the proposed clinical trial. Clinical trials should be uh, scientifically sound and described in clear, detailed protocol. Uh, trials should be conducted in compliance with the protocol that has received prior institutional review board or institutional ethics committee approval, favorable opinion, medical care uh, given to and medical decisions made on behalf of subjects should always be the responsibility of a qualified physician or when appropriate of a qualified dentist. Each individual involved in a clinical, uh, sorry, in conducting a trial should be qualified by education, training, and expertise to perform his or her receptive tasks. And this is where the delegation law comes in, uh, which will be covered later on. And then freely given informed consent should be obtained from every subject prior to the clinical trial partic uh, participation. All clinical trial information uh, should be recorded, handled, and stored in a way that allows its accurate reporting, interpretation, and verification. Uh, then we talked about confidentiality and then investigational products should be manufactured according to good manufacturing practices. And systems uh, with procedures that uh, assure the quality of every aspect of the clinical trial should be implemented. All right, so that is your principles and you can read through them. Um, I went through that quick because those are your Overall principles, when you talk about the principles of ICHGCP, just keep in mind risk-benefit ratio needs to make sense. There needs to be informed consent and people can't be coerced uh, into the participation in trials. Those are really some of the, the core. I mean, you want good documentation to come and several other things that are all part of making sure that your clinical trial data is uh, up to par. So. Uh, that's everything from that. That is not going to be a heavily tested section um, directly on the ACRP CCRA exam. So it's something I would read through just to make sure you know the principles of ICH GCP um, and move on. But now we're going to get into section three, which is Institutional Review Board slash Independent Ethics Committees, RBIAC. And this is where the testing really starts. This is some, where you should really know your uh, guidance inside and out. And uh, this is something that I'll go over slowly. So let's go over the responsibilities of an IRB or IEC. I'm, I'm just going to say IRB, but you can um, add it's IRB or IEC depending on what's applicable. So an IRB should safeguard the rights, safety, and well being of all trial subjects. That is the goal of the IRB. And then it uh, mentions that special attention should be paid to uh, specific documents. So the IRB should obtain the following documents. Um, and this is a listing you should know. So what is the IRB to obtain? It should obtain the protocol, any amendments, written informed consent forms, and uh, consent form updates, the investigator purposes for use in the tri trial, subject recruitment procedures, written information to be provided to subjects, investigator brochures, available safety information, information about payments and compensation available to subjects, the investigator's current uh, CV, 
or other documentation uh, evidencing qualifications uh, and other documents that the IRB IEC may need to fulfill its uh, responsibilities. So those are all the documents that it makes sense. You, you need all that to be able to figure out if you can justify the, the study and is there any form of coercion? Is the informed consent clear? Um, it'll, it'll meet all those criteria. So those are your key documents and you should be familiar with them. The IRB IEC should review a proposed clinical trial within a reasonable time and document its views in writing, clearly identifying the trial, the documents reviewed, and the dates for the following. Approval, favorable opinion, modifications required prior to its uh, approval, favorable opinion, disapproval, negative opinion, and termination of any prior approval, favorable opinion. So the IRB should consider the qualifications of the proposed trial. Uh, they should also conduct continuing review of each ongoing trial at intervals appropriate to the degree of risk to human subjects, but at least once per year. So here's one potential question that could come up and something you should know is the frequency required uh, for IRB reviews according to ICH E6 R2. And it does specify here that it should be at least once a year, but it can be more frequent depending on the trial. So the IRB should review both the amount and method of payment to subjects to assure that neither presents problems of coercion, undue influence on the trial uh, subjects. Uh, payments to a subject should not be prorated and not wholly contingent on completion of the trial by the subject. The IRB should ensure that information regarding payments to subjects, including the methods, amounts, and schedule of payments of the trial is set forth in the written informed consent form, and any other written information is to be provided to subjects. Uh, the way payment will be uh, prorated should be specified as well. So that covers a little bit of the payment section. So we'll jump into the next section, which is the composition of the IRB and who should be on the IRB and what should the IRBs look like. Um, this is, again, something that you should be very familiar with because uh, oftentimes we think of institutional review boards, we don't necessarily think of the composition. Um, I know as a CRA, you sometimes collect uh, membership rosters and uh, you very rarely do you actually look over it and check the qualifications of the uh, individual listed there. But this is what, according to ICH E6 R2, the composition should be. So the IRB should consist of a reasonable number of members who collectively have the qualifications and experience to review and evaluate the science, medical aspects, and ethics of the proposed trial. It is recommended that the IRB should include at least five members, at least one member whose primary area of interest is a non-scientific area, and at least one member who is independent of the institution or trial site. Only those IRB members who are independent of the investigator and the sponsor of a trial should vote slash provide opinion on trial related manners. And then a list of IRB members and their qualifications should be maintained. So um, in terms of testing here, you are likely to uh, see a question about who can vote. So just remember, as it specifies here, only those IRB members who are independent of the investigator and the sponsor of the trial should vote, provide opinion on trial related manners. So that is an important um, thing to note. So the IRB should perform its functions according to written operating procedures, should maintain written records of its activities and minutes of its meetings, and should comply with GCP and with applicable regulatory requirements. So that is the composition of the IRB and some of the requirements jumping into that. So all the members who participate in the IRB review and discussion should vote um, their opinion and their advice. The investigator may provide information on any aspect of the trial, but should not participate in the deliberations of the IRB IEC or in the vote opinion of the IRB. So the investigator can provide clarifications, but shouldn't be involved in deliberations or voting. So for the procedure sections, the IRB should establish document in writing its procedures, and this uh, includes determining its composition, scheduling, notifying its members of and conducting its meetings, conducting initial and continuing review of trials, determining the frequency of continuing reviews is appropriate, providing uh, according to the applicable regulatory requirements, expedited review and approval, favorable opinion of minor changes on ongoing trials that have uh, approval, 
uh, favorable opinion of the IRB, specifying that no subject should be admitted to a trial before IRB uh, it, uh, issues its written approval uh, of a trial. So that is an important concept to note that you cannot have any subjects on a trial until you have IRB approval. And then uh, specifying that no deviations, forms, or changes at the protocol should be initiated without prior written IRB approval, favorable opinion of an appropriate uh, amendment, except when necessary to eliminate immediate hazards to subjects or when changes involve uh, only logistical or administrative aspects of the trial. Um, this immediate hazard is an important concept. So uh, you can't basically, um, or you shouldn't rather deviate from the protocol except in circumstances when you have uh, an immediate potential hazard to a subject and then you can deviate um, obviously to do what's best according to clinical judgment. So specifying that the investigator should promptly report to the IRB uh, the deviation form or changes of the protocol to eliminate immediate hazards to the trial subjects, changes increasing the risk uh, and or affecting significantly the conduct of the trial, all adverse drug reactions that are serious and unexpected, new information that may adversely uh, affect the safety of the subject or the conduct of the trial, ensuring that the primary IRB promptly notifies in writing the, the uh, concerning things concerning its trial-related decisions, opinions, the reasons for its decisions, opinions, procedures for appeal of the decisions. All right, so the final section within the IRB, section 3.4, talks about records, and this is something vital to know um, for the CCRA exam and in general. The IRB IEC should retain all relevant records uh, for a period of at least three years after completion of the trial and make them available upon request from regulatory authorities. So time frame at least three years after the completion of the trial is how long the relevant IRB records should be um, retained according to uh, ICH E6 uh, R2. All right, so that covers everything I wanna cover in this video. So this just gets started, a little bit of a get your uh, feet wet, talking about the introduction, the glossary of terms, the uh, principles of ICH, GCP, and finally about IRBs. In the next video, I'll delve into investigators and then get into the sponsors and all the regulations around that. All right, uh, hopefully you have survived this video. I know that um, this portion is not the most exciting, but we will uh, dig deeper into the more exciting portions of ICH, GCP, um, uh, sorry, ICH, E6, R2, and GCP in the next video. So stay tuned. Uh, thank you as always for uh, watching to the end. And if you made it this far, please remember to smash that like button and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.